Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, welcome to this, the first installation of the Atlantic uh, International Research Center's Networking Fridays. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. We thank you for uh, joining us. I, my name is Jerry Miller. I, I'm president of Science for Decisions, a small consulting practice uh, here in the US. And I have had the pleasure of being engaged with the Air Center um, actually since before its inception. So I'm enormously pleased to see uh, I, the development of the Air Center and in particular the creation of this um, seminar series. Um, you may have uh, surmised that uh, the series was, was created uh, due to the COVID-19 event, but I hope that it's going to continue even after that event is uh, long behind us. Given the, the very great uh, geographic scope of the Air Center, I think this kind of forum uh, can be very, very productive uh, uh, continuing in, into the future. So uh, again, thank you for joining us um, today. I want to uh, cover just a couple of logistics before I introduce our speaker. I, I, first, uh, as you know, we're using the, the Zoom uh, tool. For those of you who are um, perhaps new to Zoom, let me point out that at the bottom of your screen, there are two very important buttons. There is a chat button, which will give you the um, ability to send messages to all of us panelists, to individual uh, attendees or to all attendees. There's also uh, a Q&A button. So if you have questions uh, during the presentation, please type them into um, the Q&A uh, window and we promise to get to them at the end of the session. Uh, with uh, as many participants as we have, it would be a bit chaotic if we tried to do this by voice. So please, uh, please use the Q&A and chat boxes. I, on the right hand side of your screen beneath the, the list of attendees, there is a raise hand function. So if, when we get into the Q&A section, if you want to electronically raise your hand, I will see that and I will call on you to ask your question verbally if you have not already typed it into um, one of the chat boxes. Uh, so with that, uh, let's move uh, uh, directly to our presentation. Our speaker today is uh, Gregory Jenkins. Uh, Gregory is Professor of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science at Penn State University and Director of uh, ESEADA, uh, Penn State's Alliance for Education, Science, Engineering, and Design uh, with Africa. Uh, Greg uh, holds uh, the PhD degree in, in Atmospheric and Space Sciences from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's had uh, a, a long and storied uh, career. Early in his career, he was recipient of uh, a U.S. National Science Foundation Career Award and was selected as a, as a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, since then, he's taken part in uh, a number of campaigns I, I focused uh, I, in Africa, and of course he's published in numerous journals, uh, and I, I was recently named a Fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Uh, his research areas are in weather, climate, and air quality of West Africa. And today he's going to tell us about air quality in the context of Earth observations and how cost-effective sensors can help improve uh, matters in the public health sector. Uh, so Greg, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jerry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that you're all weathering through this pandemic and that your families are are safe and well. Um, I'm, as Jerry said, the director of ASEDA, and we have been linked to the Air Center for several years now. We have an MOU with them, and our mission is similar to the Air Network, which is really to make a difference on scientific and engineering problems throughout Africa, but also to build uh, connections across the Atlantic. 
Um, the focus has been around West Africa at this point in time. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the issues related to air quality with a focus on West Africa. Um, one thing this pandemic has taught us is that health is extremely important. And in the context of air quality, you know, it's, it's, it's also very important. So um, I'm gonna give this presentation. Uh, Jose asked me to do this one. I was expecting to do it in May, but uh, I'm always willing to participate in uh, air uh, activities. And here are some of my colleagues. They're from multiple parts of West Africa. And the picture that you see here is from Northern Senegal. Uh, it was in mid-February, about a day or two after a massive uh, dust outbreak impacted the Canary Islands. It then came into Senegal and uh, caused significant numbers of problems. So I just wanted to say that in addition to this presentation, we were planning to host a summit in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, has caused us to postpone the summit. Um, this is my hometown of Philadelphia. And we're, we're planning to have it in October at this point. And we're hoping that the pandemic will, will ease and that we can all come together across the Atlantic, both uh, north of the equator and south of the equator and really talk about how we can uh, build the air center network and work on relevant problems. So uh, I'm just gonna first give you this brief introduction. So the overview of this talk is pretty much three issues. One is um, how can we use measurements across the air network to address air quality challenges? and how might Earth observations really help us? And what Earth observations do we need? We need to discuss the connections across sectors and disciplines as it relates to air quality. And then uh, finally, I'll show you some results and then discuss additional connections to the air network. So from my perspective, I always look at the environment from these three factors natural hazards, human drivers, and climate change. And air pollution is a mix of all of these drivers. Um, some are direct, some are indirect, but when we think about the climate change, we have to think about energy policy. And human drivers are at the, the cause of many factors, so mega cities, and we are also cons consumers and producers of waste and ultimately we are producers of pollution. And then air quality is quite simply a natural hazard at times, it depends on the source. Um, most of us don't think of it that way, we think of air pollution as just an anthropogenic activity, but in fact there are natural sources that we need to consider. Um, to find solutions to air quality, requires that we think in a broader sense. So environment is connected to health, to energy, to policy, to community engagement, and to innovation. And if we really want to make a big dent in the air quality issues, we need to consider all of these. So when we think about air pollution we, and poor air quality, we have to consider that there are many different sources and that it happens at many different scales, both time scales and spatial scales. So uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about dust primarily, but if you move to transportation in large mega cities, air pollution is an issue. And if we move to waste sites all the way on the right, this is this, these are the products that we are creating every day. Now, the ability to dispose of them isn't the same everywhere. And so quite often, we will see pollution sources around waste, waste that we make every day. Um, it could be from a large scale uh, waste yard to 
just local farmers burning or, or residents burning waste um, on a daily basis. And it could also be very large scale uh, biomass burning. I'm gonna talk about all of these. So here's biomass burning, the very large scale um, across West Africa. Uh, on the top, in the left, we see October, November, December, January, and uh, you'll see that fires, these are fires from Earth observation space, where we can detect thermal anomalies. And you see over time that in West Africa, the number of thermal an anomalies increase. In addition, we know that these fires are producing carbon monoxide, um, ozone, methane, and uh, they all act as pollutants in addition to aerosols, which is basically the primary focus of this uh, presentation. In addition, in places over West Africa, we have large dust sources. Uh, Baudelé here is the largest dust source in the world. It has a major impact across the Sahel, and definitely impacts Nigeria in a very big way. Um, the, des the, the Sahara Desert is clearly a major source of pollution. Here's a picture of I don't know if I went from Brussels to Belgium, or Brussels to, to Gambia. But flying over the desert, this is a major source of pollution. And being able to predict when dust is transported into West Africa or to Europe or the Canaries is very important. Um, I show you this picture just to tell you that Saharan air and dust is a problem during the winter season because it's located near the surface. Above it, the air will be clear. So the next time you fly during the winter season, and there's Saharan dust, note that as the plane is rising, the air will improve um, and it will become more clear. But at the surface, it could be a serious hazard. Now, during the Northern Hemisphere summer, June, July, August, September, if you take the same flight, let's say going to Cabo Verde, you will fly into the Saharan air layer. So near the surface, the air would be clear in this monsoon layer, but above it, it would be it would be dusty and you could see it very clearly and as the plane continues to rise if you get above five kilometers the air will be clear again now during the summertime the saharan air is actually transported downstream to the caribbean and to the southeast u.s now why do we worry about that we say look to address air quality we have to think about many different aspects so monitoring prediction, how do we communicate it when it's a hazard, what are the linkages to health, and then how do we reduce the health impacts? What actions can we take? And these are, are all connected. Um, it may look like it's one arrow to the next, but sometimes there are arrows crossing each other. They're going across the screen. So the point here is that in West Africa, we have a lot of work to do. So green would mean we've done enough. Orange would mean, well, we, we need to make more progress, and red means we're deficient. I think, in my opinion, we're deficient in the communication of the hazards. We're deficient in the ability to reduce the impacts, and then our monitoring is very poor. And then prediction and health linkages, those are work in progress. Very important work. So let's talk about Saharan dust. We know from many studies that does an impact many parts of the body. We often think about the respiratory system, like if you're asthmatic, um, the airways become inflamed, and then you could go into acute kinds of symptoms. But in fact, air pollution related to dust has been linked to stroke, to meningitis, uh, to heart failure, um, to COPD. Many of these issues large portions of our populations may have. Um, so we need to really understand this linkage a bit better. And I wanna tell you about some of the work that we've been doing. But first, let me just tell you in terms of Africa, uh, 
A recent study has suggested that PM2.5 is a major contributor to infant mortality, uh, associated with more than 20% of the infant mortality in West Africa. But throughout the continent, PM2.5 or these small sized particles linked to pollution sources are major problems. And recent estimates suggest that 780,000 premature deaths occur on the continent, mainly from desert dust. So it is a significant hazard. So PM2.5 is particulate matter, which is smaller than 2.5 microns. There's also PM10. So the desert, for example, can produce many large sized particles, up to hundreds of microns in size. The smallest ones are the ones that we worry about. If we're talking about city pollution or transport pollution or industrial pollution, those particle sizes are generally 2.5 microns or smaller. They have the ability to penetrate deep into the lungs. We know from many studies that they are dangerous. There are also PM1 particles. We don't know much about PM1 particles, but we know they're probably the most dangerous of them all. Not many studies have been uh, developed to understand the impact of PM1. But let me just tell you a little bit more um, about uh, the studies in, on the continent. So actually here's a study from Capo Verde where my colleagues there are looking at the impacts of dust and microbes. And so they are studying this. It's an international uh, collaboration. And I've been working with some of them, in particular, uh, my colleague at the University of Capo Verde, um, really trying to figure out how do we bring this together. But we know that health is being impacted by dust particles. And furthermore, we know from a recent study from uh, data collected in Dakar, um, this paper was just accepted, that there are many pathogens on the dust. And these pathogens we breathe in, we don't really know what the net effect is. But we know that there are many pathogens on dust particles and probably on many pollutants, including soot. We just don't know enough. But clearly isolating them and determining the potential health impacts would be important for doctors who might be treating people with respiratory infections, for example. In Senegal, we have looked at the, the, the respiratory health issues, the disease itself. And in fact, we've tried to focus on asthma bronchitis and, and acute respiratory infection. Now, acute respiratory infection and bronchitis tend to impact the youngest uh, age groups, so under five. But asthma is all across the board, so it impacts all ages in Senegal. And we have limited data, so we really need to think about how do we bring uh, the health discipline and the environmental discipline together so that we can say we know what's causing these, uh, these types of uh, comorbidities. And in Senegal, one interesting thing that we found is that over time, the number of people that within an age group um, tend to have increased. So in terms of gender, this is for men and women, we've looked at the data. So boys tend to have a higher burden of acute respiratory infection when they're young, under 14. But over time, the burden shifts to females to women who may have families and there are implications about the health of women over time. Um, you know, this first one is 15 and 60 and then beyond 60, we see this shift. So more than 58% of the cases in Senegal during 2015 and 16 were female if you're over 15 years of age and less than 60. So there's this shift in burden in uh, acute respiratory infection. And uh, we also see that with asthma. So over time, the asthma shifts from male when you're young 
to female. And this, these are important things to consider, especially for this age of 15 to 60. These are important things to consider when you're looking at policy as it relates to health um, of families and of women and treatment. So let me move away from the health aspects and talk about how do we observe pollution and, and in particular particulate matter. So there are two ways, satellites, and satellites are really important. And then we have ground-based sun photometers. And what they're looking at is backscatter in general for, for particulate matter to give us a sense of how much might be in the atmosphere at any given time. And then we also have in situ ground measurements. So why do we need satellites for monitoring pollution? First, we have continuous temporal sampling. So satellites are going by each day, very important that we get new looks on what particulate matter might look like from space. So it's telling us about the spatial scale of pollution events. Um, so we have the spatial sampling. So we see the entire globe with satellites on any given day. If we had one instrument at the ground, we might not know what the pollution is a thousand miles away or how they might even be connected. So we need the satellites, very important tools. Um, we need them to initialize our models. So around the world, pollution models are run, global dust models or regional dust models. If we don't have the satellite data to initialize and to assimilate that data into these models, the, the predictions, the initial predictions are wrong. And ultimately the impacts or timing of when an event could happen are also off. We have long time series for aerosols for particulate matter going all the way back to 1978. We need that if we want to know about trends. And again, that data can help us to identify trends or patterns, both globally or regionally. So the Earth observations are very important now, and they will be even more important in the future. And we need the satellites to help us to drive policy. So once we know the scale of pollution events, we can start thinking about national or regional policy. It's hard to think about the local policy because there are some, still some challenges for satellites. So here's an example of a visible image from space. And in red, I've circled the country of Capo Verde and the Ten Islands. And you can see from this picture that Saharan dust is ubiquitous. It's all over the place. The real questions are, you know, how much dust and how bad? Those are the questions that we hope to get from the Earth observations. So if you use an aerosol optical depth, it helps us to identify where dust particles or biomass burning particles are. And that's really important. This slide tells us here that the visible images show that there's dust. The, 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 the satellite images of aerosol optical depth give us a much greater scale to show us, much greater spatial scale showing us that dust is all over the place. It's, it's coming from West Africa and it's impinging out on the Eastern Atlantic. And it's also many aerosol properties, many aerosol particles down along the Gulf of Guinea. That's important information. But there are some limitations. So if there are clouds, we really can't tell about the aerosols below the clouds. They degrade the image. At nighttime, because the sensors are looking at uh, 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 visible uh, scattering properties, we don't really have good coverage. Now, the, there are products, so UMETSAT creates an RGB product, which helps us to identify dust at night. But, but even that, that observation is degraded at nighttime. Um, and then we have issues of temporal. So if we have an overpass uh, at one time, it needs to coincide with the pollution event. Maybe the pollution event happens when the satellite isn't overhead. 
in which case we need to bring together multiple satellite images. And then spatial coverage. How do we get down to the level of a city when we have an overpass to be able to say something about the distribution of pollution within the city? These are some of the challenges over the next decade that we need to address. And then the real important question is, we're all down at the ground, at the surface. Can we determine what particulate matter concentrations are like the, from space? There is going to be a push on this, but we need surface observations to really help us uh, in terms of developing algorithms that give us a real clear understanding of how bad the air might be at the surface. So here's the nighttime problem and clouds in this picture. So here's a MODIS image. The satellite has not yet passed over Africa. It's nighttime. So we don't really have a good idea of the, the, the amount of pollution over the continent for this. This is the Terra overpass. Uh, we won't have that for some hours much later. Uh, we do see that there's pollution in India and in Asia, but that's about it. And also in this picture, you can see where there are clouds, we can't really tell you how many, how much the aerosol loading would be below those clouds. So those are problems that we have to con contend with. So let's go back to the same picture on December 4th. So from space, we know that there is dust over the Cabo Verde Islands. Now, if you were on the ground, the, the image on the left is what you would see. There would be lots of, it would almost look like fog, but these are dust particles and they are everywhere. And to your right is a picture a few days later where you can see that the, this is a radar. You can see it, maybe it's three kilometers away, um, but you can't see it on the, the day when there's lots of dust. So this is the information that people at the ground need, decision makers, because imagine you have an airport. You wanna know what is the visibility of that airport. We can't really tell you that from space at this point. You need to bring together surface measurements plus the satellite observations to, to make this all work for a decision maker. So, why do we need networks of particulate matter to, to qualify, to quantify uh, air quality? First, we have fast growing megacities all throughout the world, but certainly in Africa. Second, we have localized sources of pollution. So if you live near a waste site, you should be clear about what those uh, air quality values are like and if there are health implications. Um, in some places, we have limited access to healthcare, especially in rural zones. So we really wanna know in those zones, if there are pollution problems, what are the values? And how can we share that information with healthcare providers? We need to have real-time information so that decision makers will be able to say, this is what we should do at local to regional scales. And we need to evaluate the satellite products and the models that we have. We need to do that through the surface measurements. And then we need to communicate the issue. So it, it, it can be a natural hazard. And when, there, when we think it's a natural hazard, it should be communicated to the public in real time. So, if we looked at the surface measurements, these in situ measurements around the world, on any given day, we would see that there are lots of them. America, Europe, Asia, fewer in South America, Australia. But when we get to the continent of Africa, we really do not have many in situ measurements of air pollution. And that is a problem. So it means that in real time, the average citizen has no idea what the level of pollution might be as it relates to particulate matter. And again, my focus would be PM 2.5 because of the negative impacts on the respiratory and cardiovascular system. 
Now, in some places, like in Dakar here, they have, in fact, a kind of an EPA, and they have six sites around the city. The real problem is, is that we don't know what the values are around the rest of the country. So it's very important for a very large megacity like Dakar, probably three to five million people, to know that, yeah, pollution is bad. And here's an example that I'm going to give where we're trying to take it to the next step. So on this day, it should be March the 12th, we had very bad air quality across the country. One would say, well, what about the rest of the country? Uh, so air quality we think was bad across the country, and Dakar is very bad, okay? And we were trying to understand, well, what was it that made the air quality so bad? Well, it was a large dust storm over North Africa, and this was driven by weather. And ultimately, all of the dust particles were taken south or transported into Senegal. And it was transported across large parts of West Africa. So this was a millions and millions of people were probably being impacted by very poor air quality associated with dust. So for us to figure out what we thought happened in Senegal, we've used a model, a regional dust model. And from that, we were trying to say, well, what do we think the impacts were? So this next slide gives a panel of nine days. So 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And this panel would give you the sense that, hey, something is happening. At the beginning, the, the air quality was relatively good. So green would mean good, red would be hazardous. So over time, you can see as the days went on, you see more and more yellows, browns, oranges, and reds. So the model suggests that large numbers of people were impacted by very poor air quality. Uh, it wasn't just Dakar, it was the entire country. And we used some calculations to just, and we used GIS to estimate the number of people impacted by unhealthy air quality during these 10 days. And and you get down here to like, you know, more than three days, 100% of the population may have been exposed to unhealthy uh, PM10 concentrations. And then 100% of children under five were probably exposed to that. We got down to five days. We're still talking about more than half the country, the population being exposed to unhealthy air quality. So this is an exposure problem and it's a multi-day exposure problem. And that is really a big problem because over time, we're not really sure how poor air quality impacts the, the body, but probably after about three days, you would have some significant symptoms, whether, you, whether it's asthmatic or COPD, you would feel something. So why do we need this as, as it relates to uh, why do we need real-time networks of particulate matter to quantify air quality? First, we have air quality in the center. We need it, if we went clockwise, we need it for research. We have to say, we understand what is happening, you know, as it relates to air quality at any given time. Seasons, days, hours. We need it to help us with policy, especially as it relates to pollution and health and megacities. The public needs to be aware of air quality, and clearly we need to share this data with hospitals and clinics in real time to let them know, oh, there's a likelihood that the air quality is gonna be extremely bad over the next day or two. And then they can move into action. All right, I'm Jerry, I'm checking my time. So I'm gonna keep going forward. So what we designed is kind of a prototype low cost uh, a sensor network with universities and governments. Most of our efforts have been in Senegal, but we've been working in Capo Verde, we've been working in Ivory Coast, we've been working in Angola, and more recently we have a station in Nigeria. And the idea here is to distribute 
So we saw in the earlier picture that there are very few real-time measurements across the continent. The idea here is to make these available. Lots of work to do, but we don't just need this in Africa, we need this everywhere, especially wherever there are low, low uh, sparse networks of air measurements. So these low cost network, low cost sensors, we're evaluating them. They're typically between 200 and 750 US dollars. Here's an example of the one on the left. This is a clarity. This is a good sensor. Um, it runs on solar. It can connect to the internet, so you can put it in remote areas. And this other one here, these are three students that we value. Okay. Sí. Um, so we've been evaluating these sensors. Uh, here, this one here is the purple air, and there are many purple air sensors around the world. So here's a picture. Uh, on June 11, 2019, we found two of these sensors. Well, we had one in Senegal, and there was one in Ghana. And since that time, we've been building a network of low cost sensors. It's not easy. And we have found out that there are many issues. You know, can we keep the Wi Fi going? Does the power go down? So you need people on the ground to build a network. And that's what we've been doing. My colleague in Ghana has been building a network um, throughout the country, a very important network in both cities and rural zones. Now, I'm just, just going to show you a few pictures that this is just the setup for how we see dust in the winter season. These circles here are, these are dust sources. And during the winter time, the Azor, Azores High moves in from the Atlantic and it brings dust across the Sahelian region. Um, this year, at least in January and February, we had very anomalous conditions with many dust events, largely from Baudelaire, creating a large zone of dusty weather from the Gulf of Guinea to the Sahel. So many, many people were impacted this year. So I'm gonna show you just a few uh, examples from our network that we've been building, but first just to let you know that we're focused on PM 2.5, these are AQI values that the US EPA has developed. But in general, if we get more than 55.5 microns uh, uh, per meter cube in at any time, but generally over a one hour period, we consider that unhealthy. And then we can go higher and higher to hazardous levels. We want to be at this low level, good, and that protects the population. Um, for short term and long term. So here's an example of another dust event. Uh, Capo Verde is here. I should have circled that. But you can see in this picture that there's dust over the region. This is January the 2nd, 2020. Um, here's a comparison between two cities, Sao and Praia. And Praia is much, much larger. Uh, probably 300,000. Sal is pretty small, less than 50,000. And here would be the values in microns per meter cube, and below is the time from the first to the fifth. And here we can see how these dust events were impacting both uh, cities. So this is Sal. We saw the first dust event on the second. Um, these values are considered unhealthy. In, in Praia, the values were considered very unhealthy the next day. And then over the time period of uh, five days, we saw another increase to unhealthy levels in, in Praia. So many people were exposed in Praia. And here, if we look at the number of hours, let's say up to 120 hours, those five days, of the percentage of hours that were in these categories, for both Sal and Praia, we find that moderate to unhealthy levels existed. In Praia, 58% of those hours were considered unhealthy. So people were exposed to poor air quality for 
you know, a significant period of time. There's no good, so the, none of the time periods were considered good. They were uh, moderate to unhealthy. And if we then look at this larger picture, um, we say, well, what about the other cities like Dakar, Abidjan, Praia? When we compare those for a 20-day period, you would see that in Abidjan, most of the, so now we're talking about 440 hours, we see that up to half of the time was unhealthy to potentially very unhealthy. There are no good days in this 440 hours. In Dakar, about half of the days had 50% uh, 50 had good air quality, but you know we moved into these zones where the air quality was unhealthy. And there's yellow, yellow to orange, so unhealthy sensitive means that if you are asthmatic, you begin to feel the impacts of poor air quality. All right, let me push forward. So we're going to have to develop um, a network, a networking approach, regional networks, where we can address health and air pollution partnerships. So the partnerships would include many different sectors, so doctors, researchers, et cetera. And then we have to take it to the next step. Once we understand and quantify air pollution, we need to, to, to communicate uh, with the public. So coordinated public uh, campaigns like a national asthma week in a country or a national pollution week helps to raise the awareness to the public. Um, well, we do need measurements to do any of this. Now, I just end this around COVID-19 because COVID-19 is on our mind. There are studies suggesting that air quality is a factor and in this current COVID-19 outbreak. So air quality can drive comorbidities like respiratory or cardiovascular disease. And those could in fact impact your ability to fight off the infection. So if you're asthmatic, as you know, COVID-19 tends to attack the respiratory system, you already are in a state of vulnerability if you have COPD or if you have uh, asthma. So you're more vulnerable to the disease. But over the next few months, we need to think about how air pollution or air quality might interact with COVID-19. So first of all, we've had levels, what were the levels of air quality over the last few months? As we see the number of cases increase, we should look at that. Um, biomass burning in the Southern Hemisphere is going to reduce air quality over the next few months. And then dust will be transported down towards the Caribbean. And that's, that could be an issue. And finally, we're gonna have wet season diseases in West Africa. We know these already exist, vector-borne and waterborne diseases. And then asthma and acute respiratory infection. Those tend to come up in, uh, in maybe the number of cases during the wet season. So we have to be aware that uh, people's immune system may be compromised from all these different factors in the coming months. It's a good reason for us to make sure that we're monitoring uh, the air quality and looking at the connection to environment and health in the coming months. So here's our Purple Air Network. I just want to end this showing you a few results. So you see we have a coastal network in Senegal and we have measurements in Cape Verde and I want to show you a few measurements from Abidjan and uh, one or two, one example from Nigeria in the city of Ibadan. And you can tell here that these are, we have measurements also in large cities like Ghana. That's my colleague uh, from uh, Ghana who has put these measurements up. So if we looked at just the period of the 1st of February through, through the 15th of March, when we've seen cases of COVID-19 increasing in Africa and certainly exploding in the United States, if we look at Sao, which is in Kabul, Dakar, um, Abidjan, and Ibadan during this period, we would typically say that, hey, the air quality has been very good in Cape Verde. 
So it should be less of a factor in driving comorbidities. But if we start looking at Dakar, Abidjan, Ibaran, the, the air quality has not been good in these locations. Um, Dakar has certainly been better from the 1st of February through the 15th of March. In fact, because we saw a big change in circulation, which reduced the amount of dust. And also, as we all know, that ultimately COVID has reduced the amount of traffic and pollution. But if we move towards Abidjan and Ibadan, we see that air quality is an issue during this period. And we should be mindful of that as we think about the future. So we say, look, it's played a role maybe in terms of comorbidities of asthma or COPD. The air quality has not been good. Be mindful that those people may be, asthmatics and others may be vulnerable. Watch those populations carefully. And as here's just Senegal cities, you know, we've seen even across Senegal that there's varying levels of air quality between the 1st of February and the 15th of March. All right, let me just go towards the end here. Here's, here are pictures of fire anomalies. So this is biomass burning from last year. Uh, during May, June, July, and August, the top figure here is May. So over the next few months, we expect that biomass burning will increase both in Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, and in South America. This will be an air quality issue. Um, knowing how the values in large cities change over time will be important. So you want to protect vulnerable communities as the air quality um, is worsened over time while COVID-19 is developing. And then finally, this is uh, some infection. These are acute respiratory infection reports from our paper in 2019. And what you see here is that as we move into the wet season, these are the adult reports. As we move into wet season in July, August, September, the number of acute respiratory infections go up. This is completely tied to the wet season. So we have to be cognizant of the fact that over the next few months, as the wet season begins and matures, that there will be people with acute respiratory infections, their immune systems may be compromised, and with COVID-19 out there, we have to pay attention. So ideas for the air network. Obviously, we have to continue expanding the particulate matter, monitoring network, megacities, pollution zones, and we should be doing this in all of the air network countries. We should be thinking about capacity building workshops across the air, air central network. This has satellites and models. Um, so how do we build the capacity across the air network? I believe we can do it. Um, we should evaluate our predictive tools with these, with these PM surface networks. Uh, we need to develop a framework for communicating hazards. This is in every air country. We should be thinking about how do we communicate hazards in real time using social media, social media, so social media networks or mobile phone apps. Um, how do we support the linkage or supporting the linkages between the environment and health and doing that across the network? So we have a picture of what this connection is across the air network. Um, we have to think about policy. And again, the air, I believe the air center, the air network, we could do this. We could think about how do we bring together uh, policy on energy, on air quality, on health. How do we bring community partnership in all of this? And uh, that's my last slide. So thank you for listening. And I hope that this will spur, bring on uh, more conversation and more action um, in the near future. And I look forward to being part of that. Great, Greg. Thank you so much for uh, this informative and inspiring pre presentation. We have uh, 17 questions in the Q&A queue, as well as a few in, in the chat box. Uh, many of them revolve around uh, questions of data and data availability. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to try to collapse a few of those together. 
uh, okay. I think we'll address all of the um, all of the points. Um, first, I let and and by the way, a couple of questions have been answered by other attendees. So uh, again, in the interest of time, I will skip those since they've already been taken care of. Uh, but first, let, let me uh, start with a question about um, I, uh, data on particulates from gas flares. We talked about various other sources, dust, biomass, burning, et cetera. Um, I, but there's also particulates from, from gas flares. We see that here in the US uh, as well. And we've also seen some reduction in that since the oil market has crashed due to the COVID-19 uh, event. So can you tell us um, a bit about particulates from gas flares and whether or not you have seen in the data uh, reduction or change in that uh, in the last several weeks? Um, we don't have any measurements around uh, gas flares. We have very few measurements in general, probably 15 or 20 across all of West Africa. Those tend to be located in large cities um, and also spatially so that we can figure out what's happening. But I would believe that this is a strategy that we need to take. Because there are many local sources of pollution, we need to have measurements around uh, industrial sites. And we need them not only near the site, but we need them downstream of the site so we know what those communities downstream are receiving. So we don't have that, but these are one of the activities or one of the ideas that I feel the Air Center could undertake uh, across countries or regions. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but I would have to assume that in Ghana, not Ghana, yes, there is a measurement site near an oil refinery. And those are some of the highest values I've ever seen. Uh, typically all hazardous and, uh, you know, you worry about downstream communities. Uh, this, this whole issue of, of, of industrial pollutants has been a major issue in the United States for um, communities of color and poor communities. We talk about environmental justice and making sure that people have clean, fresh air to breathe and that there are no health impacts from those industrial sites. Yeah, good. So let me uh, switch now to the topic of biomass burning. One of the attendees noted that uh, biomass burning aerosol from Africa is already measured in, in Amazonia. Uh, so that long distance transport obviously is the case. We've seen that for dust uh, I, you know, for quite a long time. Uh, but the question is, in, in South America, are those quantities not only measurable, but are they measured in uh, magnitudes that are of, of concern for public health purposes in South America? Good question. I really think we have to look at that. The, I would have to believe without a doubt that what we see in West Africa during the biomass burning season, those values are high. They are, they are unhealthy. Um, we have to believe that that's the case in Brazil, for example, in Angola, Zambia, during biomass burning season. We need more measurements. And those, those particulates are very interesting because they have a black carbon component to them. And so when you're breathing those in, the, 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 the health effects might be different than a mineral dust. So there may be a carcinogenic impact to that. Those particles tend to be very small. And so we don't know the full health impacts, but I really think that they need to be monitored. And I, I think that having these networks, real-time networks, allow us to see you know, when the start of the biomass burning season begins and when it ends. And we could see that in, in Abidjan. So we have just a couple of minutes uh, left, and I want to get to uh, uh, other questions pertaining to, to data. I, I, one attendee asks, is there open and free spatial data for the development of scientific studies? And um, I, uh, the second question is, do these air quality st studies cover Angola? And if so, can we reach down to the city scale? So there are questions of both coverage uh, and, um, and spatial re resolution. 
So let me go to the Angola question first. So we have partners in Angola. We have now eight stations in the country. So this will be the first time, including the capital city, uh, it will be the first time to see what is the impacts of biomass burning on air quality in, in Angola. So we have a partnership there, MOU that we've developed, and we're hoping to see for the first time the Southern Hemisphere uh, biomass burning signal. In the, in the question in terms of data, uh, the philosophy here is to make the data real time, open, and public so that researchers can grab the data if they want, but also doctors or people in policy or decision makers can see in real time what's happening in their own city. Um, I feel like that is the key as it relates to awareness and communicating potential hazards from air quality. Yeah, good. So we are down to, to one minute and uh, let me just pose the, the Final question, there are many more that, that we won't get to during the oral uh, uh, session here, but these questions are going to be recorded, and I'm sure that Greg would be happy to um, converse via email with, uh, with the questioners and uh, uh, resolve additional questions that we don't actually get to. But let me turn your attention, Greg, back to the, um, to the meteorology and the, the atmospheric uh, dynamics here. I, one questioner asks, uh, have you addressed the influence of ENSO on the air quality patterns in West Africa uh, and also in, in Amazonia? Uh, so those large scale weather uh, events, have you looked into those in terms of transport and, uh, and um, delivery of, uh, of uh, uh, pollutants? Uh, and with that, I'm actually going to sign off and uh, because I have an immediate uh, I call after this one uh, and ask Jose Moutinho to, uh, to wrap things up with a few words on uh, future installments uh, in this Networking Friday series. So uh, thank you all again very much from my end. Uh, Greg, you can take that question and then Jose will uh, close things out. Thank you all. Super, thanks Jerry. Um, the question is about these large scale uh, anomalous patterns. So we more or less related to climate variability. There's no doubt that ENSO, the North Atlantic Oscillation, um, and ultimately climate change will influence the transport patterns. We don't really have enough knowledge or measurements at this point to know that. But that would be a super working group to get together and say, hey, what are the facts, the impacts of these large scale um, internal variability sources around the globe? How do they impact us? Um, in, in Africa, certainly West Africa, the North Atlantic Oscillation is a key driver of long range transport. We don't know enough about how that's changing over time. But there is a sense that in its natural state, you know, decades might have certain patterns. But with climate change, there is a sense that the natural variability is being altered also. So the future, uh, very uncertain about long, long range transport. But this is the time to start. There's no reason why we can't start looking at those now. Okay. So, Greg, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was fantastic, as usual. <laughs> very nice with this very nice clothes from Senegal, I guess. That's from Ghana. This one is from, from Ghana. Ghana. Oh, that's one from Ghana. I thought it yeah. was okay. Good. So thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much for all the other participants. What I'm going to do, I'm going to send all the questions that uh, are not still answered by Greg. I'll send them by email, connect to you, and then maybe Greg will take some of his precious time to reply to some of these questions and, uh, in, in next week. Uh, and Jose, what I can do is, uh, when I see the questions, I can put it in a format, like an MS Word format, answer them, and then send them to the Air Center so yeah. you can post them. Oh, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. So, uh, the last thing is that 
I hope I will meet you and uh, all the rest of the attendees on May 8th with Samuel Mafuila. Samuel is over here. Uh, Samuel, can you say something about your presentation, a teaser of your presentation? Samuel, can you listen to me? Yes, Jose. Yes. So please, can you say something about your presentation on May, uh, on May uh, 8th? Yes, uh, on May 8th, I'm giving the overview of the aquaculture development in Southern Africa. So it will be an interesting focus on, um, on Southern Africa in terms of uh, development of aquaculture. So please tune in, tune in again to our Zoom meeting so that you can uh, hear what Southern Africa has to offer in terms of aquaculture. Thank you. Okay, so thank you everybody. So we are adjourn the meeting right now. I hope to see you soon in two weeks. Bye. Goodbye.